equity and inclusion in healthcare. Thank you so much, Phyllis, for taking time out of your busy schedule to join in this session with me. And we also have a dear colleague, Christina, who will also be joining as well. So let's just give her a second to join virtually via Zoom. Christina, are you on the line? I'm talking. <laughs> Don't see video, but for the essence of time, you can appear whenever your video appears. If that's okay with the tech team and everyone? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Um, I'm not able to start my video, but won't allow me to, so I'll just kind of be a, a voice. Okay. Awesome. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. So, what we will do today is what we call peeling back the onion. We're going to peel back this onion as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion from the lens of rare sleep. So, today we will touch on the perspective of the patient the provider, the researcher, and the research participant, the healthcare ecosystem, and then we'll also examine partnerships. So before that, I think it's really important for us to level set and have some operational definition around what is diversity, equity, inclusion, what is health equity, and what is social, what are social determinants of health, and what are those five domains. As a public health practitioner and a health equity advocate, I think it's very important for us to really understand the terminology that we're tossing around and utilizing in a very committed and important space. So diversity, what does that mean? It means people, individuals, thoughts that come from various walks of life, very mixed views, and it can all be very meaningful and important. Inclusion, bringing everyone that should be at the table at the table and making sure they have a full seat at the table. Equity, putting in and incorporating the appropriate accommodations and modifications to ensure that everyone is level set as they come to the table with their diverse perspectives and input as it pertains to a topic. When we think about social determinants of health, those are factors that impact, impact how people live, work, play, and worship. That built environment that really impacts how a patient shows up and how they interact in the environment, including the healthcare ecosystem setting. I also want to touch on the five domains of social determinants of health. And please don't judge me with the notes because there's a lot of onions to fill back today and a lot of great information. <laughs> so the five domains of social determinants of health I want us to keep in mind of this because we'll circle back to this a little bit later. The first one is economic stability, and that's a great segue to what Rebecca just mentioned regarding the insurance piece. Second is education, access, and quality. And I also want to touch on education, access, and quality, neighborhood, environment, and built, and also social context and community. So what we'll do today is do a round-robin discussion and we'll first kick it off to Jalissa from the patient perspective. All right. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Here Hi, everyone. So just starting off with the uh, patient's perspective. Um, as a person with rare sleep, um, I need to remind myself, and we need to remind ourselves the following. In terms of inclusion, um, we must include ourselves in the hopes and dreams that we hold. And I think a lot of times, once we're diagnosed with a rare sleep, we tend to exclude all those dreams and hopes that we once held on for so long. Yes, we do have experiences, um, we do experience losses and have had to make compromises along the way. But what we, but what we have gained from it and how can, we, how can we use this gain to better ourselves and those around us? So for example, um, for me, I was diagnosed with IH as I was preparing for the MCAT and applying to medical school. It has very much 
been a driving force in determining the career path that I want to take. Secondly, I've been a perfectionist since I can ever remember, and it's been to my detriment. And IH has helped me control that perfectionism because IH and perfectionism do not get along. So that is definitely a gain. And even though there have been a lot of changes and sacrifices and compromises that I've had to make, I am trying to see the positive of something that can be viewed as so negative. Now, when it comes to equity, um, as a patient with a uh, rare sleep disorder, we need to be fair with ourselves. We may not be able to reach a given point in ways that people with a normal energy level can, but we can still get there. For example, I can't sit down and write a paper in one sitting for four or five hours. I mean, I'm going to have to take a nap in between one, somewhere in those five hours, but I can definitely write that paper in smaller chunks. So, Yes, you may not be able to accomplish certain things the same way as a person with normal energy level can, but that doesn't mean you can't get it done. And when it comes to diversity, um, we must use our diverse backgrounds to ensure that we include the discussion about rare sleep with all. In my case, I consider myself an American with a Hispanic cultural heritage, and I am bilingual. bilingual. So I do feel a shared responsibility of being a part of educating and building awareness among the Latino community just because of the background that I come from. And awesome. Chris, Ms. Christina? Yes. She's arrived. Oh, yeah, I got off the video. Um, I just wanted to you know, make a quick point for patients that patient advocacy is so important to take that advocacy into yourself. So if you're at a doctor and you don't feel like you're getting the right treatment, they're not listening to you, there are other options for you. Um, I myself, when I was first diagnosed with hypersomnia, the doctor gave me no information and really left me in the dark. And so I actually found the Hypersomnia Foundation's clinical directory and was able to find a doctor that completely helped me. So, you know, make sure you know that, that you can stand up for yourself and make sure that you get the treatment that you deserve. I think this goes back to what everyone knows and holds true is the value of patient centricity and patient-centered research and patient-centered engagement throughout the full life cycle of research and engagement. And I think when you are participating in a research opportunity or when you are doing a non-observational study, which could be in the form of a survey, um, to really challenge and ask the researchers and the teams what is the plan to make sure that the studies and the activities are truly representative of the patient population um, in that capacity. It can be very overwhelming going through a journey of living with a rare disease, and then on top of that being a patient where the journey is very ambiguous in some instances regarding the referral pathway and the treatment pathway. And we'll touch on some of the other nuances and challenges a little bit later, but the patient-centered approach is the best approach and the only approach that we all should be doing as we navigate research, development, and engagement in education as pertains to rare sleep. Now pivoting over to the provider's lens as pertains to DEI and healthcare. Jalissa, I'll pitch it over to you first. Yeah, so um, I'm in med school and obviously I'd love to make that transition. Well, I won't ever leave, I'll never stop being a patient, so I can't make a full transition of being a patient to provider. But I do have high hopes that one day I will be able to become a provider. And as a patient with rare sleep, I'd like my future self and other providers to be reminded of the following. Uh, when it comes to inclusion, um, just please listen to us and include us in the decision-making process. We need you to hear our voices. As a patient just diagnosed, you are my confidant. You're probably the first person that understands what I'm going through and can help me fix what is going on because this is gonna, this is gonna have an end eventually. Um, However, it doesn't have an end. And so as a patient that realizes rare sleep is here to stay and that I'll need continuity of care to manage my condition, you become my caretaker. Um, I feel like oftentimes the relationship between a patient and provider tends to be very transactional. And with telehealth, unfortunately, I feel like even more so. And, and I don't want you to have a transactional relationship with me. I want you to be my partner. Um, 
and I want to make sure this is a partnership. When it comes to equity, please hear me out when I request accommodations. Without your support, we may not receive appropriate accommodations that will help us be successful in our, in our education and careers. Uh, many times in my medical journey, I have had to pull myself up from my bootstraps and have had to explain myself whenever I have any kind of short, shortfalls without the support of the academic institution or a provider um, to speak for me. Yes, it's okay for me to be a self-advocate, a self to have to advocate for myself, but I would like for it to be shared. I'd like for my provider to advocate for me. And also, when it comes to equity, please hear me out when I get upset that there's a delay in my refill. If it were up to us, we would prefer not taking a medication to stay awake. Um, so please have checkpoints in place uh, to make sure that there aren't any interruptions with our treatment. Uh, when it comes to accommodations and proper treatment, they quote unquote give us the functional capacity to live normal lives. So please be diligent on, on making sure that you provide the best care possible for us. Awesome, thank you. Just to build on that, from the provider lens, it is evident that we make sure that patients' essential needs are met, and that goes back to the social determinants of health. If a patient's core essential needs are not met, how they show up in the clinic setting or even in a telehealth setting can be very um, challenging to de develop rapport with a patient, between a patient and a physician. Looking at a patient having food insecurity, access to transportation, the digital divide for crying out loud, to expect a patient to be adherent and compliant with their medicine when they don't have essential needs to internet and information to get the education that they need so they can come to you to make a shared decision and an informed decision. I challenge everyone to think of those accommodations that Jalissa mentioned. It's from a research perspective, and the FDA guidance has clearly laid that out for us for, as providers and as researchers to think about clinical trial concierge, home visits, decentralized trials as far as doing virtual sessions. Those type of accommodations are essential when it comes to patient engagement. The other piece I want to touch on is some of the cultural relevance and to really lean in to say, being an African American or a black person we are not homogeneous. Race is a social construct. So it is important for us to think of this whole ideology of mistrust in the black community. I really want to challenge this audience, in person and virtually, that we, there are some nuances there and some segmentation. For example, in the Hmong community, um, in, that, in that respect, in the Ghanaian community, I'll, I'll start there, in the Ghanaian community, there's instances where older individuals overtrust what their physician says. So you can see the differentiation between this whole ideology of, oh, African American and black, the mistrust of the medical system, but in a subset of that, the Ghanaian community and immigrants overtrust the healthcare system, and what you say is gold standard. Another example, there's the Gola Geechee example in the MUSC area in South Carolina. Really thinking about those cultural nuances of how a patient shows up and how it really frames out how they see the world and how they see the healthcare ecosystem. And another example is in the Hmong community. We've seen that um, for some invisible rare diseases, patients are sometimes saying that they have an evil spirit or some demonic spirituality piece with their rare disease. And it's important for providers to understand that cultural context as they're educating patients around their diagnosis and their treatment options. Christina, anything you want to add there from the provider perspective? Yeah, um, I just wanted to add that, uh, first, you both just explained it beautifully, but also if you're a provider and you're talk, meeting with your patients, you can't get that background social information if you're only spending five minutes with the patient. So it is very important to make that connection and really learn who your patient is. Absolutely. And thinking about that piece, the review of systems as far as what physicians provide, spend more time with the social history review to understand those cultural nuances that need to be incorporated as you're developing treatment plans and diagnosis pathways for your patients to increase adherence and trust in that capacity. 
The next piece we'll go to will touch on researchers, current and prospective participants as well in the research ecosystem. So one thing I want to open up is talk around this piece of uh, utilizing data for clinical trial recruitment and engagement. And I want to give a really clear example to outline how data can help drive research, but it has to be inclusive data. Let's take example the course registry. So I, as a board member of the Hypersomnia Foundation, want to be very clear that the course registry database cannot be used as a third party database for patient recruitment. It's used as a pipeline resource to raise awareness and to connect patients to opportunities to research so that they can make informed decisions. So industry partners or researchers can make patients aware that are in that, data, that database that there are research opportunities that may be well suited for them to consider and think about. But when we think about providers and the research participants, over the past year and the need for diversity and representation is there is an unmet need for diverse specialists and physicians that are treating patients from marginalized and unrepresented communities. But luckily last year, there was some data reported that last year was the largest and most diverse me incoming medical school class um, in the US. So that is great news. And hopefully some of those individuals will go on to work in the space of sleep and neurology. Now thinking about why we need diversity in research and why we need diverse participants engaging in the ecosystem of research is that from a safety and efficacy perspective, we want to make sure that drugs and products or devices actually have background data to understand that patients from all walks of life, genders, race, ethnicities, geographic, that there's data to support that this drug is efficacious in various patient populations. We want to make sure that we understand the unmet needs and the barriers and the endpoints that we talked about earlier in today's session are truly representative of the total population that are impacted by this disease. And I know for, the, for us in the hypersomnia community, um, it is a challenge because getting patients into the database of registries and getting them into research, they have to know what the heck they have. And that's where the importance of community engagement is, and we'll talk about a little bit of that a little bit later as well. The other piece as far as the diversity of research is that not only the physicians and the researchers have to be diverse, but also the research staff, the clinical research nurse, the clinical research coordinators, the clinical research assistants. It is essential that people sitting on the other side of that table at the clinic has someone that looks like them, has that cultural reference of them, and that they can relate to. And that's a big, big contributor to developing rapport and trust. I will also speak on from um, some statistics as far as representation in research. People of color make up of over 30% of the population. Research participation is about 16% in, clini in clinical trials overall. Keeping in mind that it takes about seven physicians to get a diagnosis for a rare disease, it's almost double for marginalized and underrepresented individuals. So you can see the need for further engagements for participation in research as well. I will also touch on the uh, FDA guidance as it pertains to clinical trial diversity. As mentioned earlier, there was some guidance put out in April around what should industry and researchers do as it pertains to diversity in research. And some of those core components really talked about out of the box thinking of how to engage with broader communities and to really bring in the patient perspective early on into the clinical trial design. For example, partnering with black Greek uh, fraternities and sororities, faith-based organizations, ethnic and community groups early on to raise awareness and education for clinical trials. But even before that, just playing out disease education and awareness and with those type of community groups as well. The other pieces of accommodations that we touched on earlier for decentralized trials, uh, patient concierge, travel assistance, child care coverage, reimbursement, and not even just reimbursement, flat out covering it up front to expect a patient has $500 for a flight up front. Um, sometimes that's very unreasonable for some of the patients that are living with rare diseases. I will also pass it over to Christina to talk about her perspective of, to the current and future researchers and also research participants. 
So in 2018, when I was first diagnosed with hypersomnia, um, I started researching about it, and I, that's where I found the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I signed up for the courts registry because I knew that I wanted to participate in the research. Uh, a couple of weeks later, they emailed me about a research opportunity. So by the end of 2018, I was in my first trial. Um, I was really excited to do that because I was on a medication that wasn't working for me and I wasn't getting a lot of answers. I wasn't sure what to expect when I went into the trial, um, but they made me feel very, very comfortable. They gave me the informed consent and they walked me through it every page, explaining exactly what was going to be happening during the, during the trial and what my experience would be like. They even told me that if any point during the trial, I decided that I didn't want to participate anymore, I, I would be good. I could leave, there, there would be no hard feelings, and I could participate in another trial if I wanted to. I didn't leave them. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure what to expect. But in my second clinical trial, I actually did end up stopping about halfway through. Um, it wasn't working well for me. I was having a lot of side effects. And I told them I just couldn't do it anymore. They, it, it was very simple. They said, okay, I signed a paper and I was done. About uh, maybe like two months later, they contacted me for a third clinical trial. So that absolutely told me that they're right. If you do go into a trial and you don't feel comfortable anymore, or the medication isn't working anymore, you can quit. And there's always more opportunities for you. I did ask at one point about diversity in the clinical trials at the um, clinic that I was at, and I was very shocked to hear that it was not diverse at all. All of the participants that they had were white women, and that was it, just white women. And it really started opening my eyes about how we're getting these results in, in the diversity in cl clinical trials. I just I want to let everybody know that if you are interested in a clinical trial, tell your doctor. And every single time you see your doctor, remind them that you want to be in a clinical trial. <coughs> Sorry. Um, for me, I see my doctor two to three times a year. Every single time I go in there, I ask, what clinical trials are coming up? What's, what's on the horizon? I look at the Hypersomnia Foundation's clinical trials that they post, and I also kind of stalk the clinicaltrial.gov website to look to see what's coming up, because I know that that's something I'm really interested in and something I want to continue participating in. So if you are interested, please, please do all of that, because we really do need more people in clinical trials, and we really, really need a more diverse selection. I'll send it over to Jalissa. Yeah. And just to touch on um, making the making clinical trials and just study designs, um, having them include more diverse, uh, have more diverse representation, one way to accomplish that as a person with rare sleep is just to participate in a patient registry. Um, a patient registry, like in that case, a researcher is not necessarily recruiting you to be a participant for a study. You are including yourself. You are automatically putting yourself in a position to be a research partner. And why do I say that? A lot of investigators and researchers will look at these patient registries and will utilize them to recruit individuals for their clinical trials and will even use the patient registry itself to create uh, study designs to better learn about uh, given disease. So, for example, I know recently I, Dr. Trotty, uh, maybe a couple of years ago, utilized the uh, patient registry by the Hypersomnia Foundation um, to recruit participants for a study to understand uh, autonomic symptoms among individuals with idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's just one example. Um, so if you're not recruited, go ahead and recruit yourself. You can, you can uh, diversify um, the the participation and study designs. Absolutely, and just to build on that, that last piece for us, registries and data governance, when we have registries, the data is de-identified. So what I mean by that is that your name, your address, your date of birth is stripped from the actual data source and they're only getting that empirical data that is actually scientifically needed 
to drive their research. So I just want to be very clear that no one knows that you're Mary Jane, you're 32, and you live in Charlotte when you are participating in the registry and scientists and researchers are using that information. It is de-identified and that information is reported in an aggregate format. So what I mean by that is that it's grouped, it's sampled in a collective voice. So no one knows that it's you, Mary Jane, 32, live in Charlotte, participated in that registry in that very narrowed way. Um, patient privacy, participant privacy, data governance is a big deal right now in the rare, rare disease space. So really making sure that patients own their data, have control of that data, and know the power behind it from an analytics perspective and how it can drive collective, multidisciplinary work and research and to understand the intersectionality between rare sleep and neurology and other conditions, it is critical that we all roll up our sleeves and participate in registries, participate in observational studies, surveys, clinical trials. Every little bit counts as far as collecting data in a very systematic and, co and compliant fashion to drive research and, and, and solutions forward. Switching gears again. <laughs> I'm driving this car. Jalissa told me I'm driving the car today. I'm driving the, the, the hypersomnia car. Um, so now we're going to transition over to the healthcare ecosystem. And Christina, I'm going to kick it off to you to open up this section. So um, one big thing that I think everybody is always affected with is insurance coverage. Um, but it is a huge factor in health disparity. For me, um, I, it really hit me when I switched jobs and I didn't have insurance for a month, which doesn't sound like too big of a deal until you realize I take daily medication that is controlled, so I can't get a 90-day supply. I have to get it every month. So suddenly I was without insurance and I didn't know where my next medication is, was going to come from. Um, luckily, I did find some resources and I was able to um, get it for a lot cheaper. But it really made me realize that uh, a lot of people deal with that on a daily basis. And especially people in lower socioeconomic uh, status who uh, are often on plans like Medicare or Medicaid. And a lot of times they're receiving suboptimal care um, anyways. So not only are you already receiving suboptimal care, but now you might not get access to uh, good medication or um, really what you need. Absolutely, for the essence of time, she just nailed that section for oh. healthcare ecosystem. Let's move over to uh, partnerships. I'm gonna take a quick detour on this road okay. <laughs> for this section and let's talk about partnerships here. Um, you know, it takes a collective work for everyone to really move the needle for health equity. Um, and I applaud Christina for serving as an ally. She is the example of a true ally, pushing back for her PIs, asking what are you doing for diversity. Um, so I just want to take a quick two seconds and give Christina a round of applause for being a true ally <laughs> for the rare sleep space. Um, but this is partnership, and as far as, you know, there's a lot of people in the audience and probably on the line, I'll be very honest, that don't look like me. But you can be allies, you can stand up, push the boundaries and speak on people that do not look like you, that may not have that lived experience as you. There's still things that you can do with your privilege, with your access, with your voice, and you're helping the broader community and bringing everyone along. The other piece is that, you know, the role of industry and pharmaceutical companies, advocacy groups, patient advocates like the two I have on the panel today, um, community stakeholders, this is gonna take collective work. Health equity is heavy collective work. But I think it's very important work specifically, specifically in the rare sleep space when there's so much that needs, still needs to be done from a research and development perspective and also understand an etiology of disease. So in closing, I'm gonna let everyone just give their last few nuggets of what they wanna leave with the audience today and then I'll wrap up with my shameless plug. Yeah, I, I just want to end by saying, you know, as a person with rare sleep, I just want to thank everyone who is involved in 
making our lives better, um, whether you work for an advocacy organization or a pharmaceutical company or a researcher or a physician or, or a nurse assistant or whatever. I mean, everything that you're doing to make our lives better, it doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you very much. Awesome. Christina. Sorry to kind of uh, follow that. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, you know, thank you all so very much. And um, thank you, you two for, you know, allowing me to be on here and, and talking with you. Um, I just hope everybody, you know, even takes a smidge home of what we're saying, because even, even a tiny amount will make huge changes, so. Absolutely. I would like to end by a quote that is very near and dear to me and I live by every day while doing this important work of health equity and patient advocacy. And it's by W.E.B. Du Bois, and I'll read it to make sure I do not screw this up. Now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, not some more convenient season. It is today that our best work can be done and not the future day or the future year." End quote. The time is now. So with that, as chair of the Diversity and Health Equity Task Force, I would invite several of you to please consider joining the Diversity and Health Equity Task Force with us to really roll up our sleeves and do the work. The time is now. Thank you.